God is always good. I will not despair. So, we're doing a series standing on the promise. This is le- uh, s- message number four. Let's start with this verse in Psalm 16, verse 1. And it says, Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. And from the 23rd Psalm, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father God, we just ask that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word today. Let there be an open heaven between you and these people. Help me, O God. Hide me behind the cross, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that every person here, the Lord, that has never experienced God, the goodness, your goodness, Lord, by the end of this service, that they would be able to know that you are good and you are a great God. And Lord, we just ask that you would open up the heavens and pour out your word today. Come, Holy Spirit, manifest your word. Manifest the presence of God and touch us and change us. In your name we pray. Help us, O God. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've thought about this as I was preparing this message, and I've thought about the goodness of God several times over the years, but I came up with this question, how can I know God is good, not just think God is good? I have struggled in my life to really know that God is good. I theoretically know that God is good because my Bible says that he's good. And I could I could believe and and I could believe when for a lot of my life, I could believe that God would be good for you. But sometimes I had a hard time believing that God would be good for me. Anybody ever feel that way? All right. So. Um. I, I think a lot of it has to do with this. When I was nine years old, um, my brother was killed. He was my older brother, 16. He was the oldest of us six, and he was killed in a car pedestrian accident. And when you're, when you're nine years old or when you're young and you have a, a loss like that, or some of you maybe have lost a parent when you were young, and it, it does something to your worldview. It, it changes your worldview. And, and I remember growing up thinking, well, you know, this tragedy happened, and I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Now, I don't, maybe I'm the only one that's ever felt that way. But I don't think that's from God. Because God is good. God is good. And maybe those of us who uh, grew up in the church have a harder time believing sometimes that God is good because, um, uh, you know, this, but I tell you what, there is an advantage. And I know it's not, you know, the probably like they used to say, the best testimony you could have is not to have a testimony. And say, well, you know, I was like me and Janice, we were born and then the next, you know, the next Sunday we were in church. And, um, you know, I don't know if my mom gave us Cheerios, but I don't know how many times we fell asleep underneath the pew. Okay. In fact, one time uh, uh, when my baby sister, she's the youngest of us of six. Uh, once my parents locked up the church and we loaded all the kids in the car and drove off and my mom looked around and said, who's got the baby? <laughs> and the baby's still asleep at church <laughs> under the pew <laughs> and we had already locked the church up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they had to go back and they had to get the baby. But you know, some of you know the goodness of God because you, you, the, it was like I have a friend who said, before I met the Lord, I felt like I was a Satan's crash dummy. I was running into walls and I was, you know, he was just, 
I, my life was messed up. And when you have a, a dramatic testimony where God had saved you and you know what the world is like, you can say, yes, praise God for God's goodness. But sometimes some of us, we who grew up in the church, sometimes we can forget and be distracted to be from what the enemy says, that God isn't good. Maybe he'll be good to somebody else, but maybe not to us. Well, my premise today is, is that God is always good. God is always good. Where was David when he, when he began to write Psalm 16? Uh, David was being hunted like a bird in the mountains. Uh, King Saul had grown extremely jealous of him. In fact, he was living the outlaw life. In fact, uh, in, in 1 Samuel 27, uh, or 1 Samuel 26, excuse me, uh, he had, uh, there's this story, and I'm going to read this that kind of makes reference to this, 1 Samuel 26, verses 17 and 20. But let me give you the context of the story. So David had been on fleeing from Saul, and he had about 600 men with him. But the whole army of Israel was chasing after him. Saul's army, which was a lot bigger than David's 600 men, who were very lethal, uh, dangerous men. But he was, always, he was always on the run. And then this story happened in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 26. And um, it was Abishai, I believe, uh, he snuck in with David into the camp. And Saul was there. And uh, this artist, that Saul's laying down and he had a spear stuck in. And God had put all the men into a deep sleep. And he snuck in there. And uh, he went and he grabbed Saul's water bottle and he grabbed his spear. And Abishai said, hey. Tell you what, I can take my sword or my spear right now and I can pin Saul right here, right now, and that will end all of your problems. And, G, and, and David said, you know, do not touch the Lord's anointed. And then, then he went away and then he started, he woke up the camp as he yelled up from some cliff or something and, and he said, I uh, uh, I believe it was Joab or or Abner. Who was it? <laughs> I should I should remember. <laughs> Let me look. It was the the leader of uh, Saul's army. And and uh, I'm sorry. Who was it? Abner. Okay, Abner. And he yelled down there. And he said, "You should be put to death because you." Yeah, I could have killed him. I could have killed the king. And you don't even deserve to live. So let's take off and read right here, this passage right here. And uh, it's up on the screen. David replied, yes, it is I, my lord, the king. Saul answered and yelled up to him and said, who is it? And he added, why is my lord pursuing his servant? And why I have... And and what have I done and what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my Lord, the king, listen to his servant's word. And it is the Lord, if the Lord has in, incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, men have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have now driven me. From the share in the Lord's inheritance, and they have said, Go serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall on ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. What David was saying is, You have, I have been cut off from all the things of God. See, insecurity sometimes can block God's goodness. Past failures, disappointment, unmet expectations often keep us from knowing God's goodness personally. And one of the things is, is sometimes we could be praying about something so much that we could make an idol out of it. A lot of people have tremendous disappointment with God. 
That's a whole other sermon, and I'll, I'll get to that one of these days. But sometimes we can have disappointment in, 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 in the things that didn't turn out the way that we wanted them to turn out. But I tell you what, I, in the end result, this, this is what's going to happen. God will always be proven right, and he will be proven good. It's kind of like the old country song that says, uh, you know, thank God for unanswered prayers. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've heard of it. You never heard of that? Some about some guy, you know, he was prayed and asked God that he, you know, I, I want to get with this gal and I want to marry her and stuff like that. And years later, he meets her and he said, praise God for unanswered prayers. Uh, God will be proven right. God will be proven right. We know theoretically that God is good, but a few of us really know God's goodness. We don't worship God as he really is. We worship our concept of God. Our concept is often clouded by our experiences in this sinful world. What did Paul say? Paul said, you, you look through as a, a glass, what? Darkly. As we were driving here today, and uh, as we passed a car, you know, and Janet says, why is that person driving so slow? Why don't you look and see if it's a, a guy or a girl? And as I was passing them, uh, I looked and I said, I can't tell. <laughs> the glass was too dark. Sometimes it's that way when we're looking at life. We cannot see the goodness of God. So, what do we need to know about God? Let's look at Psalm 16 here, and starting with verse 2. I said to the Lord, you are my God. Apart from me, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land... They are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. And I will not, I will not pour out the libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Here's point number one. God is the essence of good. God is the essence of good. A few years ago, my grandson, when he was just probably, he wasn't very old. He was like a, a couple of years old. And he could, he, you know, he just started, started to talk. And he came over to uh, Papa and Grandma's, uh, Grammy's house. And uh, um, so my, my, my son-in-law, if he ever hears this, he'll probably, you know, kind of get after me. But my son-in-law, he was on this health kick. And no sugar, nothing in the house. He loves ketchup, though. And the tastiest things my grandson ever tasted at that point in his life was ketchup. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so we put him in the high chair. And then um, uh, my wife says, well, we just made some brownies. Do you think he would like a brownie? And, you know, he can blah, blah, he can, he can just barely talk. So we cut him a brownie, and we put it in front of him, and he grabbed it, and he took one bite of it, and he goes, that is good. <laughs> as clear as a bell. Didn't he, Janice? I mean, he could barely talk. And then, I mean, he that is good. The Bible says that everything that is good comes from God. Even chocolate fudge brownies. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. It is good. The, God is the very essence of good. You know that God is love. The Bible tells us that. But you know what? If you look in the dictionary, you'll see a picture of God when you look up good. God is good. God is good. The attributes of God. God, his unique attributes that are just unique to him. God is omnipresent. Everywhere is in his presence. God is omniscient. He omniscience. He knows everything. God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. God is transcendent. God does not need us, but he desires to have a relationship with us. 
God is eternal. He goes on forever and ever. God is unchangeable. And God is perfect and holy. And God is triune. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you don't notice, the, but today's outline is an outline of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, his moral attributes, we can, we can sh not, we can't, those are distinctive to God. We can't be in everywhere at once, but we do have a presence. We're similar to those, the, uh, those, uh, those attributes of God on the left-hand side. But the moral attributes, we can share those with God through a redeemed life. God is good. God is good. And then God is love. If you look up the God is in and, and, and here's here's what God is not um, God is good, but he's also just and he's not one uh, more than the other. He is infinitely of on all of these. He's good. He's love. God is merciful and uh, God is, excuse me, compassionate. God is patient and slow to anger. God is truth. God is faithful, and God is just. God is all of those things. God is the source of all good. Uh, Psalm 25, 8 says, The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. Without God, there is no meaning in life, no personal happiness, only the Lord's presence brings blessing and good into our lives. It's like a cog that is missing in a watch without him. C.S. Lewis said every, every person is born with a hole in their heart that only God can fill. Philippians 1.21 says, For me, Paul said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, he also said to the Galatians, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. One of the things that just, you, what, what David was saying in this passage was, he said, you know what, um, I just, all I need is God. All I need is God. How many remember in 2017, I believe it was uh, October 1st, remember the horrible shooting in Las Vegas? Remember that crazy guy that was up there and um, he got up from a, a casino window and there was a concert going down and he just started raining fire. How many remember that? One of the, one of the things... Um, Everybody, they, they looked into this guy. And I mean, he did, he, there was 59 people that were killed. 869 injured. 413 of them by gunfire. Because, and everybody asked this question. They said, well, here's a guy that's highly intelligent. He had a lot of money. He, uh, he had, there wasn't one thing that he didn't have in life. He had a nice house. He had a nice job. He had all guns. He had, he, he had all the money that he could gamble. And, and he had uh, people that loved him and cared for him. Why did he do this? And I, I would hear on the news and people, and, and, and people were like uh, psychologists and things like that. And they kept saying, well, why did he do this? We don't understand why. He, you know why he did this? Because he was empty inside. He had absolutely nothing inside. If you do not have Jesus Christ in your heart, you are absolutely and totally empty. You become a, just a vacuum. You can have all the pleasures of this world and be like King Solomon who said, there is nothing that I have denied myself. And it's nothing but vanity, vanity, vanity. This man 
saw no meaning in life, his life or anybody else's. God is the source of all good. Without him, there is no good. The second point is this. Spend time in God's lettuce patch. Did you know there's a lettuce patch in the Bible? It's in the book of Hebrews. Psalm 16, 3 through 4 says, The godly people in the land, my true heroes, out of the New Living Translation, I take pleasure in them. Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. Yeah, that's, that's something you should really think about. Um, you know, if you're going to go chase after other gods, your troubles are going to what? Multiply. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak, speak their names to other gods. Let's look at the lettuce patch. Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews uh, 10, 19 through 24. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is what? Faithful. Let us and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards the love and good deeds. And let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us, I, I missed one lettuce, okay? Let us encourage one another all the more as we see the day coming. How many know that we are seeing the day coming where Jesus is coming again? I think we are in the last days. To know God's people is to know God's goodness. Because the body of Christ, the church, is good. I, you know, I, I still have a, 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 my office. I still have my office and my books. I'm using it kind of as a, as a study place in Rainier. And uh, so Friday I was working on this message and I was in that office. And then I got up and I went to the sanctuary and I was praying. And, uh, you know, how, how good is God's people? I went back to my desk and somebody had snuck in while I was in the sanctuary and put a gift card on my desk. Isn't that nice? I've, I've met lots of people, but I think God's people are the best. I remember when we would be doing busing ministry and uh, we would go to a family and they couldn't speak a uh, lick of English. Maybe they only spoke Spanish. Or maybe they only spoke Vietnamese. But you could tell which ones were believers. Even though you could not speak their language. Is that true, Brother Steve? It's true. I tell you, um, I went, the happiest people I ever met in my entire life were, were the people in Haiti. They didn't have probably two cents to rub together. They lived in a, a, a little house with dirt floors. But they were the happiest people I ever met. It's not the stuff. God is the essence of goodness. And since this is the body of Christ, God's people are good. You need God's people. Um uh, one way to get to know uh, God is to get to know God's people. That is what David missed in his outlaw life when he was on the run. He said he missed God's people. You know, if you're struggling to know God's goodness, it is probably because you are absent from God's people. You need to get into church. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but maybe somebody through that camera needs to hear this. 
you got to get into church. How does this all apply to me? Let's look at verse 5 and 6 of Psalm uh, 16. Lord, you have signed me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Suddenly I have delightful, I have a delightful inheritance. Number two, point number two, Jesus is the secure lot. David said, David said, I basically what he was saying was, I've been I've been disinherited from all my worldly possessions because I had a place in Bethlehem and you know that that was my inheritance was was is, is any person who is an Israelite their promise is the land and he had a promise in the land but he had been disinherited and what did he say he said the lord is my inheritance The Lord is my portion. The Lord is my cup. The Lord is my lot. Jesus is our secure lot. Jesus is our secure lot. He is the one. Jesus is an irrevocable inheritance. Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And then Numbers 18, 20, And the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in the land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. He was talking about the the Levites and to the uh, Aaron Aaronic uh, priesthood. He said, you know what, you don't, ma- you don't have land like all the other tribes, but I'm your portion. They can take everything away from you except one thing. And you've got to remember this, they can never take away Jesus. They can take everything away from you. They can take your family, they can take your, your house, they can take your car, they can take your microwave, they can take your hot tub, and I know you got one. They can take all of that stuff away. But there's one thing they cannot take away, and that's Jesus. It is an irrevocable promise. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then Psalm 27, 13 through 14. I am confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. You belong to God and you will see his goodness in the land of the living. Just wait for the Lord. You're not going to have to die and go to heaven and see a pie in the sky uh, and, and get the happiness and the goodness. But what this verse here says is that you will see the goodness of God right here in the land of the living. Letter B, your allotment in life will be good. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. John 14, 23. My father will love him and he will come. We will come and make our home with him. And 2 Samuel 6, 12. Now David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought the ark up of God and the house of Odom Edom, the city of, of David, with rejoicing. What this means is that, to give you a little context in the story, was that David, with the Philistines, had captured uh, the ark and, and he wanted to move it uh, all the way from Shiloh and then move it up to his the new tabernacle that he had made and so as he was moving it 
they didn't do it properly, and what they did was they did the wrong thing. They put it on a cart, and as it was going on this cart, it, it, they were great rejoicing and things, and all of a sudden they hit a rock, and the ark almost fell down, and a man reached up to grab it, the ark and steady it. But as soon as he touched the ark, he was immediately dead. And that stopped the party right there. And that was, it was all done. So uh, they went to Obed-Edom's house and they, they, they put the covenant, they put the ark of the covenant, the ark of God's presence right there. And when they put the ark of God's presence right there, then David went up to Jerusalem and he waited several months. And then a few months later, he said, well, man, that ark is a dangerous thing. We should do something with that. Uh, maybe somebody better go down to Odom Edom's uh, farm and see if he's still alive. There might be a big hole in the ground like a nuclear explosion take off, took off. But they went down there. And what the word says is that Odom Edom was greatly blessed. And so what David did was he immediately he did the right thing. He got the priest to carry the ark and they sacrificed, made a sacrifice every six paces and all the way into Jerusalem. Here's the point. Wherever God's presence is, wherever God's presence is, that's where God's blessing will be. If you have God's presence, you will have his blessing. And uh this verse here, it says, Philippians 4, 19, And my God shall supply your all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Your inheritance is this, that the Father and the Son have come and made their home in your heart, and you will be blessed. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of his presence, Jesus will meet all your needs. How does this affect my ministry? Let's look at the verses 7 and 8 of Psalms 16. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. And I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Number three is this. The Holy Spirit is good fellowship. Holy Spirit is good fellowship. You can ask my former uh, youth pastor, Matt James. He was the greatest youth pastor. Uh, he had tremendous, a profound effect on my daughters. And uh, we went through a kind of a difficult time. We uh, were in this one building, and, and the lease was up, and we would had uh, several people had moved. Um, I had uh, one couple went in to the mission field, another couple, of these were all folks in, in the ministry, one couple moved their, their business to Arkansas, and another couple, they had to move back to Springfield because they needed help with their family, and so after all this, then we happened to get a piece of property that was just coming open, and it was a Baptist church, and we signed a lease for it. And but before we could occupy it, what happened was the there was the church had voted to close. But some of the disgruntled members who didn't want to close the church went to a judge and got a, a court ordered injunction to stop the closing of the church. But we had already vacated the building we were coming out of and we and it was rented and leased out to another church. And we were counting on to get into this building. Well, they said you could have another building for another month. And so we went there for a month. And then at the end of that month, on December 1st of that year, we were a homeless church. And we bounced around here and there looking for a building. And finally, we got into um, a Russian church, a, a, a Belarusian church, and we could meet in the afternoon. But in the, in the meantime, while we were mount, bouncing around and moving around, we lost some people and some families. And finally, we got into this grocery store, this old grocery store that had been remodeled into a teen center. And we got into this teen center, and when we were in this teen center, uh, we were fixing it up and remodeling it, and we, uh, but all of a sudden, the fire marshal shows up, and the building inspector shows up. And when they in showed up, they came in and they said, hey, 
the, the city council has voted that this, uh, this area uh, on this boulevard is going to be uh, uh, refurbished and rehabbed. You can't be in here unless you get a conditional use permit, which was $7,500 and a six months at the minimum to go through that. And they, they told us, they said, well, we can come in here and legally lock your doors and lock you out at any time. So here we were. I went to the landlord and I said, we're going to have to break this lease because we're in here illegally. And we were just going month to month until we could work something out. But what we needed to do more than anything is we needed to have uh, an outreach. We needed to reach people. So I talked to Pastor Matt. And, and Pastor Matt had a, a brother-in-law that had, um, could get some tri-tip. He worked at a meat packing place and he could get a tri-tip. So we bought some tri-tip and uh, I went, we picked a date and then I, I told uh, all the women in the church, I said, I want you to help prepare a meal. And then all the men, I said, well, you, what we want you to do is bring a barbecue. Bring your barbecue or to the church and then we're going to barbecue these tri-tip and we're going to invite as many people as we can and then we invited a special speaker and um, a dynamic speaker to come in and, and hold a service that for the lost and so that's what we did and but before we did that pastor matt and i we fasted and we prayed the week before this outreach and this was the most successful outreach we'd ever had there was all sorts of people showed up. We had people inside and outside. There were 300 people that showed up. And uh, that outreach went without a hitch, completely and totally. The cleanup was a cinch. The setup was a cinch. Uh, we even had tri-tip left over. And we even took some of that tri-tip over to the bar next door to, to bless them and say, hey, we're... We're, we're not against you, but we, we just want to bless you with this and invite you to church. So we did that. But here's the point. The point about that is, is if you have God's presence, if you have the presence of the Holy Spirit, He will make provision and He will make things easier if you have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The only way that anything will be successful is if we have the Spirit of God in it. First point, letter A, is seek intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the very last uh, verse in 2 Corinthians. May the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So there is... There, there is the, the grace of, of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Psalms 127, 1 through 2. Unless the Lord builds a house, its labors labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants to sleep... Uh, uh, for he grants sleep to those he loves. I had this passage, uh, Psalm 127, was the, my passage to preach on during graduate school. And as I was studying this, I saw something in the NIV translator notes. was this. It says in the NIV translator's notes, it says, Eat, for he grants sleep to, or eat. For while they sleep, he provides. Here's the thing about it is when you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit and the Lord builds the house, then then when the presence of God is there, you uh, you can go to sleep and sleep and God will work even when you are sleeping to provide whatever you need to have had done. You will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Ministry is only as, as effective as the presence of the Spirit is there. Fellowship in the Holy Spirit means while you pray and speak in tongues and prophesy and spend time in His presence, God will build the house. And while we sleep, He works and provides for us. The last two verses of Psalm 16, the last three verses read like this, verses 9 through 11. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. 
my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let the Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The second point is this. His presence has benefits. There are four benefits David recognized here with the presence of God. First was the protection. Acts 16, 7 say, says that when they came to the border of uh, Maesia, uh, they tried to enter Bethnia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. How many of you, how many times have you come to a place where all of a sudden the spirit of God said, don't, don't go this way or don't go that way, only to later to find out that you avoided some type of terrible accident or kept you from doing the wrong thing. The second thing was joy. He said that there's joy in your presence. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When we are full of the God's presence, we have joy in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, when Acts chapter 2 happened and the, they, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in tongues, and there was so much joy that those that were mocking them thought they were drunk. What a great thing to be so full of the Holy Spirit that people think that you're drunk. Then there's the resurrection. We have the benefit is the resurrection power. Romans 8, 11, And if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. You might be suffering some type of illness or sickness or whatever it might be. But if you have the Holy Spirit with you and you, that resurrection power will be also the same resurrection power that can be the healing power. It will quicken your mortal body. We can ask the Holy Spirit to heal us. The fourth one is this, eternal pleasures. Matthew 25, 21 says, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge with of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. What does that mean? Is that not only God will bless us in this life, but I believe that God will bless us even greater in the next life. We will have eternal pleasures. There's going to be great things, and I don't even know what they are. The Bible says the eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God is going to do for those who love him. We know the great things. God has eternal pleasures for us. What do I need to remember as I close with this? Jesus talked to, called himself this. He called himself the good shepherd. John 10, 11 through 13. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is hired. He is a hired hand. He cares nothing for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I want to close with this thought. Why is Jesus the good shepherd? He is the good shepherd because when the wolf comes, when the wolf comes, Jesus is doesn't run away. He runs towards the wolf. The hired hand always runs away. I heard this story about Amy Carmichael. She was a great missionary, born in 1867 in Ireland. And she lived to be until she was in 1951. She was a Christian missionary who opened up an orphanage and she was served in India for 55 years without a furlough. She wrote many books on missions, but she tells a story about God's goodness. And 
in this story, she, when she, uh, she was a young girl, she used to go to, uh, er, she was envious of those girls, the other Irish girls that had beautiful blue eyes, but she had brown eyes. And in her brown eyes, every, every night she would pray and she said, Lord, please give me blue eyes. I would like to have blue eyes so I fit in with everybody else, with all the other little Irish girls. And so she would pray this, and every morning she would jump out of bed, and the first thing she would do, she would go and she would look in a mirror, and as she would look in that mirror, to great disappointment in her, uh, that every, when she looked in that mirror, their eyes were always brown. Well, she grew up, and as a young woman, she went and heard Hudson Taylor, the great missionary from China, and she felt a call of God to go to missions and go to be a missionary in China. And so she began to take off. Uh, uh, she went and applied to be a missionary to China, and the mission board there said, well, you, we don't, you can't go to China. We have enough missionaries in China. What you need to do, we, we want you to go to India. She goes, well, I don't have a call for China. For India, I have a call for China. I want to go to China. No, you, we, we have enough missionaries in China. We need missionaries in India. We want to send you to India. So finally she said, okay, God, I'll, I'll go. And she said, okay, to the mission board. And when she got there, what she found out was in the Hindu temples, um, the families, when they had boys, they would keep the boys because they could work on the farm. And, but the girls, the little girls, what they did was they would take these little girls and they would sell them into prostitution into the Indian temples. And the, the Indian, the Hindu priest, the Hindu priest would take these little girls and they, should, they would lock them in the basement. And then when, when somebody came to make an offering to the Hindu god, they would make an offering, and then they could go and, 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 and that they could have sex with these young girls that were being abused. And this went on for years. And then when Amy Carmichael came there, she found out about it. And when she found out about it, she felt like God needed her to do something, so she started an orphanage. And when she started this orphanage, what she would do, she would raise money up and then she would go buy these girls. And uh, there was very, very expensive to buy these little girls. And some of them were teenagers and some of them were little girls. And she would buy these girls and she would bring them back and put them in this, this home for them. Well, one day... What she used to do was she would take coffee grounds and she would rub them on her hand and rub them all over her skin to make her skin look dark. And then she would dress up as an Indian woman. And as she was getting ready and she had rubbed the coffee grounds on her face and, and made her skin look dark and then she put on a veil and she looked in the mirror and all that she could see was her eyes. And when she looked into the, her eyes, she saw that she had brown eyes. And God spoke to her. And she, you, know, you know, all those years ago, when you used to pray to me to turn your eyes blue, this is the reason why I never turned your eyes blue. Because if you, because you have brown eyes, and you, so that you could go rescue these little girls from human trafficking. And at that moment, she didn't know. She said, I had, I had many times I began to doubt the goodness of God because he, ne he never answered this prayer. But then that moment, she realized and she understood that God had answered uh, in his goodness and his divine love and his divine nature and his divine wisdom. He did what was right. She never would have been able to rescue these little girls from human.
human trafficking if she had blue eyes. Jesus, he's the good shepherd because he never runs away from the wolf. Satan is always impugning God's character. Uh, there are a lot of stuff happens into, into this world. Uh, Satan usually comes and tells us, and he talks to us, says, look at all the bad stuff of what happened in this world. Why, if God is such a good God, why did he make a, a world that has so much suffering in it? Well, the answer to that is God did not create this world. We created this world. God made this world good, and he made it perfect. And he gave it to Adam and Eve, our parents. And when they sinned, it went over, the deed went over to Satan. And it, the suffering and all of that came about because of him. We created this world of suffering. And maybe you're in this position where, where you have been disappointed with God because there are certain things that didn't happen the way that you wanted them to. You prayed about this thing and you prayed about that thing and it never happened. And you, you lost that person and that person died. And you were disappointed in all the way that things happened and turned out. And Satan is coming and said, well, if God was a good God, then he wouldn't have allowed that to happen in your life. But I want you to know this, that everything that happens in our life, some way, somehow, God can turn it into good. Just like Amy Carmichael. She so wanted, she so wanted to have blue eyes, but God had a higher purpose, a higher calling. And when God doesn't answer our prayers and when we lose people and things go wrong, God has a purpose in that. He does have a purpose. And you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. You just have to hold on. Wait upon the Lord. Let him work things out. And you'll see the goodness of God. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You know God is good when God is all you have. Jesus runs towards the wolf, and the hired hand runs away. But the good, good father sent his good, good son to redeem you by laying down his life for you. You may be disappointed with God, but don't listen to the enemy. God has a good plan for you. Just trust him. Believe in him. And he will work things out. You will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? I think what the Holy Spirit is saying to you is maybe sometimes all your disappointments, just take them and lay them at the feet of Jesus and trust him. Because some way, somehow, he's going to work things out so that you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Father, we just pray right now for every person that has had, they don't understand why this happened or why that happened or that disappointment or that setback. But Lord, you are a good, good father. And you have a plan and you will work things out. And one day, one day, if we just stick with you, we will turn around and we will look back and we will say, praise God, I went through that experience because now I see the goodness of God. And Lord, for those who are in the darkest place right now and they don't even know if they could trust you, God, I ask that you would help them to trust you. 
in this dark time that they would know that they will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.